Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where I invite you to join me in navigating uncharted digital waters and learn more about how technology is transforming industries that you possibly never thought of before or associated with technology. And today, I'm going to learn more about the mental health and well-being among seafarers working in the maritime industry. But most importantly, as this is a tech show, how technology can improve working conditions by automating some of the tasks that traditionally needed to be undertaken by crews. Because seafarers working in today's cargo industry undergo many physical and mental challenges in their line of work, most of which is completely unseen or thought about by the likes of you and me. And many seafarers make significant sacrifices and experience needed to work in an offshore environment. However, there is evidence that these workers may be particularly prone to emotional exhaustion and burnout which all can take its toll on them. And seafarers, of course, do tend to work as part of small crews, work long hours and have contracts that require them to be at sea for up to 12 months at a time, which unsurprisingly can cause loneliness, isolation and even depression. So buckle up and hold on tight. Or should I say batten down the hatches and prepare for trouble because I'm going to take your ears on a voyage across the seas to Gothenburg, Sweden. So we can speak with Ross McFarlane at Fugro, who's going to talk about technology and the impacts on seafarers that are working in the maritime industry. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Ross. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Hi, Neil. Uh, first, just to say thanks for thanks for having me here. Um, so yeah, my name's Ross McFarlane. Um, I work for, for Fugro as the USV Policy and Public Affairs Advisor. Um, and I kind of I came here through through a maritime background. So I did a cadetship uh, with an oil an oil company, a uh, oil tanker company first, before uh, moving moving on to uh, offshore support vessels. And then um, I found my way into the office, uh, working for for Northern Marine Management, looking after fleet training for them uh, before going back to sea for a little bit, um, back back offshore again, and then uh, th- through cruise ships before finding my way to Fugro. Nice. Um, where I've, I've moved into this position looking after regulations covering uh, USV and mass and kind of looking at the, the future skills evolution that's, that's involved there. Love that. And one of the things I always try and do on this podcast is get people thinking a little bit differently about industries that they don't always associate with technology. And Fugro is known as a geodata specialist, collecting and analysing comprehensive information about the earth and the structures built upon it. But can you tell the listeners a little bit more about the kind of problems that you're solving with technology? Yes. Yeah, so, so as you say, um, we're, we're a geodata company, so our, our, our roots are in soil investigation. Um, but we've really grown that and expanded it to, to a, full, a full sort of platform which supports the, the, the full life cycle and, uh, of, of, of projects, essentially. So, so what, we, we, what we've tried to do is to use technology to achieve faster deliverables and better quality data for our clients. So to make sure that decisions can be made as soon as possible um, using well the assets are on site, essentially. So uh, we've developed a, a full suite of technology, which allows us to, to gather data, analyze it quickly and get it to the client in order for them to make decisions. Um, so we've got platforms such as, such as Fugro Roams, which looks at as um, a solution for vegetation management which obviously helps uh, helps like power power line companies and stuff like that uh, power companies installing their their power lines and maintaining them and it allows them to then do that from the office rather than doing on site inspections essentially um we've got other technologies such as like our, our Ryla uh, set solution which goes on the front of trains to allow us to uh, analyze the tracks and again vegetation on the tracks and it really all our solutions are designed about giving giving as much data as possible and as high a quality as possible and then allowing clients to make decisions based on that. Um, so when we're talking about from the media aspect, when we're offshore with our, our USVs or MASS, which which stands for uncrewed surface vessels or marine autonomous surface systems, um, if we're gathering data offshore, the traditional way of doing that would have been to to 
set up a vessel specifically for a purpose to gather data, send it out, uh, bring it back ashore, analyze that data, make a decision about what then needs done, and then sending another vessel out, maybe not for, uh, to actually do the work which is required. So now, f- from from these kind of smart solutions which we can offer, we can we can do that instantaneously almost. We can have a vessel out there which is is equipped to do different aspects of the job, gather the data, make a decision, and do all that whilst the vessel's there uh, in kind of in one go rather than taking multiple attempts at it. So I guess efficiency and quality are the two the two benefits of the technologies. And you do specialise in the emerging autonomous shipping sector and also experienced shipboard safety and navigational officer. And you've got quite a backstory here, how you've worked your way through the ranks. But I've got to ask, where did your passion for tech come from? I think it's kind of a, a multifold answer here. So yeah. My passion really came from, I guess there's almost a generational thing in that I was born sort of at the right time. Um, because, you know, to go exa- for an example, like my first car had a, had the tape player and now I'm all the way through to owning a car where I can store all my, my uh, music and stuff on my phone and connect it wirelessly. So, you know, I've, I've kind of been part of that generation, which has seen a, a real expansion in technology, but a more kind of an early level, I guess, I always had an interest in science fiction, you know, and discovering the limits of possibility and kind of advancing human, uh, well, it, I, th- I think technology is essentially one of the cornerstones of human evolution, and it is the basis for human advancement, isn't it? Really, since the evolution, yeah. uh, since the invention of the wheel, um, and, and as Charles C. Clarke once wrote, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is almost indis- indistinguishable from magic. So, I think it's kind of a, a real sense of discovery, and it's it, it's it's a way of exploring new new boundaries for humans, essentially. And I just think that's really exciting. Love that. Love how you got a Arthur C. Clarke quote in there as well, talking my kind of language. And it has been, though, a challenging year for just about every industry. But can you tell me more about mental health in the maritime industry and possibly share some insights that you've gained throughout your career? Because, again, it's something that people listening probably don't automatically associate with that career. Yeah, so... Um... I think this is a really good time to be talking about uh, mental health in the maritime industry. Um, I'll maybe just throw a quick few statistics at you. Yeah. Like uh, from the maritime perspective, ninety percent of the world's goods are shipped by sea, and that is done by approximately one point six five million seafarers. Um, so, so that's kind of like a, the wheel that makes it all churn. And um, during this this period, there's been a, there was a, some statistics released by the IMO where 400,000 seafarers were actually stuck at sea, um, and that means that they were exceeding the limits which are set by regulations for the time that they're supposed to be at sea, um, and unable to do crew changes because of the travel restrictions and such like that. So that has a huge impact on mental health. But kind of previously to that, there was surveys conducted which showed that approximately 25% of seafarers had scores suggesting that they had signs of depression um, and 20% of those had um, suicidal thoughts. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. Kind of, there's, there's, there's five kind of key areas which have been identified, which is uh, fatigue, obviously, from being away and kind of working seven days a week for however long you're away for. The environment that you work in, in terms of it's quite, it's a physical environment. So there's the aspects of, of the, the motion of the ship, essentially. There's the fact you're away from home. Um, and then there's the, being contained on board a vessel means that you maybe don't have quite as healthy a lifestyle as you possibly would have had. Um, there's the nature of the role in terms of the workload and the stress, um, the job satisfaction. You know, you're, you're, There's only so many people on board the ship and you have ultimate responsibility of performing your role kind of to a level so that you're under that constant pressure to to achieve your goals at the highest level possible um, and there's no not really any backup for you if anything you know if, if you need a, a break or anything like that um there, there's also the, the final two things it's like the leadership so the fact that you're on board the ship so the captain is kind of he, he is in, in charge of everything on board so the vary, that can vary depending on who who is the captain at a particular point and then the final thing is is kind of the the networks that surround that individual. So family, friends, and work colleagues. You know that's that's really important. I think we've all seen that in in the coronavirus times. Um, but so being disconnected from that kind of support network is is a big issue as well. 
And you said that there wasn't really that backup in place there. So I'm curious, what are the current policies in place to safeguard things like mental health? And what is it that you think needs to change there? So within the the maritime industry as a whole, there's the Maritime Labour Convention, which um, puts in place certain restrictions and and guarantees for seafarers. Um, So it puts a limit on an 11 month contract, which means that you can you can never go to sea for more than 11 months um, within a 12 month period. Um, there's also kind of guarantees of shore leave um, that your company won't abandon you. So like uh, throw you off in a certain port and then with no way of getting home, those sorts of things, um, which is also uh, repatriation is is a a key thing. Um, And then guarantees that your wages are going to be paid. And one of the, one of the other aspects is um, criminalization. So if, uh, essentially you have ultimate responsibility for the vessel. So at the moment, that's a lot of pressure where if you do something wrong, it's your fault. Um, and that's, I guess, depending on what sort of vessel you are and how many people you're in charge of, that's a lot of pressure to put on one person. So there's kind of guarantees of support from companies there. To bring it into to Fugro, um, I, I think we're actually quite quite well advanced in, in the, the well-being sort of the mental health aspects. Um, we have in place a Fugro employee assistance programme, which is available to all employees, both those at sea and those ashore. Um, and for those uh, offshore, for those on board the ships, we have a well-being team in place. Um, so they're kind of one of their roles is to support those offshore. Um, and we have these eight dimensions of wellness, which they, they talk about frequently. Um, they send out information and we try to encourage that on board the ships. And uh, we, we kind of we give guidance and we, ha- we have webinars and stuff like that to try and provide as much information as possible. And really, it's, it's about encouraging people to to talk and make sure that everybody's satisfied with their work, essentially. You've done a great job of highlighting the problem and the current situation there, but this is a tech podcast. And the reason I invited you on here today was to find out more about how technology could possibly improve working conditions by doing things like automating some of the key tasks or that are traditionally needed to be undertaken by crews. But is that, can you expand on that for me? Yeah. So, so one of the one of the biggest problems in, in mental health offshore is the the nature of the role, so the pressure, the workload, the amount of support which is available to you. So with the new technology which is coming in, these are really the, the key aspects that we can work on. So um, by by connecting the ship to the shore, uh, it gives us more possibilities for for offering that support, um, both from just just a communication point of view, that there's someone else for them to talk to and someone else to get guidance from, um, but we're also seeing that the possibilities to to remove the workload from the vessel. So a lot of things, um, when you're talking about automation, you talk a lot about dull, dirty and dangerous tasks. Um, and that's really kind of the focus of, of the technology. So we're trying to take away dull tasks, time consuming tasks, which aren't the most exciting. So those offshore, we're really kind of putting them to the most, um, the best use that we possibly can. Um, and then dangerous tasks is obviously we're trying to take people out of harm's way. So those those tasks which people are involved in, which um, which have the highest risk, those are the ones we're really focusing on to try and make sure that people are as kind of as far removed from that as possible. Um, the other aspects, I guess, is is the enhancement of the human. So people people only have a limited amount of knowledge, and I think it's probably fair to say that those offshore are kind of jack of all trades, master of none, maybe too extreme, but they they have a very broad knowledge base and a very broad skill set. So it's really harnessing that as much as possible and supporting them um, because obviously there's there's different equipment offshore, there's different ways that you you use it and um, maintain it. So, so we can't expect everybody to know everything about all the, all the tools which are available to them and all the jobs that's going to be required of them. So by kind of having a, a remote operations centre where we have a, a centralised knowledge base, we can then distribute that knowledge out kind of more evenly across across all the all the areas that we're operating in to try and spread that knowledge as far as possible and make sure that those are in the, the front line are as supported as they can be. So I'm curious then, are, are there any other impacts that you've seen technology having on the well-being of seafarers? Because again, it's something that you wouldn't automatically pair together, but what kind of impacts are you seeing? So I think um, even from my time at sea, there's there's little things which really make a big difference. So like the cost of technology meant that we could then have a, a TV in everybody's cabin. <laughs> Whereas before there was like there was one place where you could go and obviously you know if, if somebody's watching a TV show or something that you don't want you're not interested in then that was kind of cut off from you so little things like that make a big difference. 
the connectivity is, is huge. So um, being able to to be in touch with the shore whilst being away from sea is, is, a, is a huge thing. And j- just, I guess, improvements to the environment, kind of the, we're seeing vessels being designed more to, to incorporate the, 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 the human being. And as well as that, these, these new vessels which we're developing, which are uncrewed, so they don't have anybody on board, that then gives a new... Um, it allows for a new career path for seafarers that was never really there before. Um, a good example of that is uh, my wife is currently, she's she's offshore. She doesn't want to give that up because uh, she, she loves driving a ship and the only way that she can drive a ship at the moment is by being on board the ship. So these these new kind of technologies which we're developing now allow you to kind of do that job that you've always liked but come ashore and do it in a slightly different way. So it, it adds new elements in and a new career path that may, that wasn't really open to seafarers at one point. Um, so it's all kind of, there's a whole a broad spectrum of, of ways in which technology is improving things for people. Wow, I absolutely love that. And for, for you and indeed your wife, is there anything in particular that excites you about how technology is going to continue to improve the industry? I'm, I'm sure it's something you both talk about over tea at night. Yeah, yeah quite. quite. Um, I think it's on everybody's lips at the moment, but sustainability is a real key thing. So if you imagine that we're taking, if we are taking people off the ships, that means we can change the design of ships. And a, a quite, quite a large proportion of that is designed around having, having people on board. So like freshwater systems, air conditioning, food preparation and food waste areas. You know, there's a lot of parts of the ship which are designed around the human. So if we remove that, we can, we can kind of create more space for cargo and design it in a more sustainable and environmentally friendly way. Um, I think that's a, a kind of key a key topic here because there's a statistic that I read a couple of years ago, which was that the 16 largest ships in the world produce more pollution than all the cars in the world. So I think that's a real kind of key focus for the maritime industry is sustainability. So by reducing the, reducing the size of vessels um, and designing them to be more more sustainable and work it more efficiently is, is a, a real key thing. Um, aside from that, if we're if we're not talking about taking people off the ships, then there's the quality of life aspect, the the connectedness. We can with sea technology allow us to have like um, better service from the vessels. So what I'm talking about there is sort of like port call optimization. So you can you can make sure that uh, the port is prepped for the vessel's arrival, and it can turn the vessel around as quickly as possible. So that's like a an improvement on on the service for for both the the port and the the clients which are waiting for deliveries. Um, Search and rescue, you know, if you have an always connected vessel, then you know where it is if something goes wrong and you can kind of maybe preempt that to an extent. But if, if something unexpected happens, at least you know where it was when that thing happened. So from a search and rescue point of view, you can find people quicker. Um, and I think safety is probably the biggest, the biggest, um, one of the biggest issues as well. We've seen that 75% of marine accidents are caused by human error. So if we can kind of automate those processes and try and enhance the information that the human has before they make decisions or take those decisions out of humans hands uh, as well then then we can really improve the safety of the industry as well and of course we're just on the cusp of another year we're about to enter 2021 is there anything that you can share about what your primary focus is going to be over the next 12 months well from a from a football perspective everything boils around our core strategy of you know creating a safe and livable world everything that we do is really designed around creating this safe and livable world um so making our equipment more efficient so to improve the environment, making it safer so that um, for the people that are working with it, you know, they, they, they come home at the end of the day after a good day's work. You know, creating a safe and livable world isn't just about the environment. You know, it's, it's making a, you know, a good environment for people to work in, a safe environment for people to work in, as well as that aspect of, you know, improving the world and making it a better place to live, essentially. I guess from from a more personal level, I, my big focus is on um, sort of the policy currently for these uncrewed vessels, which we're developing and uh, operating. There's no real regulation at the moment, so we're working quite closely with a number of flag states to try and um, try and make sure that that's developed. And I think this is a really good opportunity for the industry to to almost start again for to an extent, um, because we're starting with this new technology. We can kind of learn from the learn from the mistakes of the past and try and improve it to make sure that it's it's fit for the next you know however many years it's, it's relevant for until the next technology comes along so yeah that that's kind of my main focus is on trying to improve that and trying to make sure that people have the skills in order to to keep going with this as long as possible 
Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast today. So much I've learned in the short time that we've spoke together. But for anyone listening that would love to continue this conversation, what's the best way of finding you online and also contacting your team? So um, if you go to, to fugro.com, uh, you can find all the information about Fugro and um, Fugro on all the major social media platforms. Um, and, and maybe if, if people are looking to contact me, they can find me on LinkedIn, uh, just Ross Mc, search for Ross McFarlane, and hopefully you should be able to find me. Excellent. Well, I'll add all those links to the blog post that will accompany this episode. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with me today. And more than anything, I suppose the only way I can close this podcast is just wish you fair winds and following seas. So thanks for joining me today. Thanks very much, Neil. It was a pleasure to be here. Wow, Ross really opened my eyes to so many things today, such as the factors and features of offshore life that currently undermine mental health and well-being. I mean, can you try and imagine being a seafarer and having very limited communication with family and friends while offshore, all due to the lack of connectivity, time zone differences and working long hours? I suspect that in the average home of everybody listening, if that Wi-Fi and 4G connection went down for more than a couple of hours, people would start to lose their mind, never mind being at sea for 12 months. But of course, I loved how technology can help support and improve conditions for seafarers, automate processes, and limit that time that they need to spend at sea. So many big talking points. If you are listening to this podcast at sea, if you've downloaded it to your podcast feed, whenever you get back to land, I invite you to email me, share your story. I'd love to get you on here as well. There's an open invitation to anyone that wants to come on. So please email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com. I'd love to hear your stories, your experiences, your insights. That's what this podcast is all about. So keep those messages coming over to me. Like I say, techblogwriter at outlook.com. And my website is techblogwriter.co.uk. So have no fear, I won't leave you high and dry. I am a sucker for a good nautical theme, but I won't rock the boat. And I am a loose cannon. Sorry, I'm out of control, aren't I? So I'll return again tomorrow with another great guest. But more than anything, thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.